loss functions. Yeah, so, you know, what can we optimize over? Well, this is a very simple loss function, right? That's exactly the one that I just described. So that's just a Gaussian. And mind you, these plots are all generated directly in Gluon. So let me explain to you what you're seeing there. So, so the blue function is the loss function that I described. So it's one half y minus y hat squared. The green function is e to the minus that loss function. And of course, in this case, as you can see, I mean, I picked y prime to be zero. And all I did is because I'm lazy, I just normalized <coughs> this green function to integrate to one over the range from minus five to five and ignoring everything that's outside. But short of that, that's a normal distribution, okay? The red line is the derivative of the blue line, and that's automatically generated, okay? So as part of your homework, you're going to use Autograd to automatically do this, okay? Well, that sounds pretty boring here, right? Because, I mean, hey, we can all just write out y minus y prime, but there are other losses where this is actually really quite a, an advantage. Okay. So let's take something like this. Let's just look at what happens with the optimization. So what we saw before is that if I minimize the L2 loss, I get exactly the mean out of it, right? And so I've just you know, plotted with those red arrows the magnitude of the gradients if I had some observations, and that will give me the mean of them. Okay, so let's take the L1 loss. And again, I, I did exactly the same thing. I took the <coughs> absolute value function y minus y prime, and I plotted this blue line. Then I exponentiated it, and I get the green line, again normalized to you know, integrate out to one on the interval between minus five and five here. And then the orange line is the derivative, again automatically generated. Now, this loss function has a rather fun property, right? Namely, its gradients are either minus one or one. So if I end up optimizing by, you know, trying to find the point where the gradients balance out, I need the same number of points to the left and to the right. Statisticians call that the median. If I had an odd number of points, I would, you know, pick that one exactly, otherwise I can pick anything in the interval between two. It's the gradient don't change. That's the median, okay? So now, let's pick something a little bit weird. So this is called Huber's robust loss. And Huber's robust loss is weird insofar as it looks like the absolute value function on the branches, so the blue line on the outside is a straight line, and on the inside it's just a parabola. So what it is, it's just a parabola which is then extended continuously with a straight line. And you need to squint really hard to figure out exactly where it crosses over. Now if you plot the derivative, so that's the orange curve, you can see it very easily. And again, that's automatically generated with gluon, this way, I don't have to do anything particularly fancy to get it. And the green line, again, is the corresponding density. So what is special about the robust loss? <coughs> well, actually a lot, because this one ensures, if you look at that, that you essentially perform trimming, and you throw the largest and the smallest terms away, and then, you compute the mean within that. As for the largest and smallest terms, the, their gradients cancel out. Anything in the middle, well, in, you have your standard you know, Gaussian loss, and everything just averages out there. Yes? Is it much cheaper to use a robust loss than it is to try and do an outlier um, uh, pre uh, participation or um, some quantity? Okay. Okay, it's a very good question, namely, what's the relation to outliers? Now, a trimmed mean estimator effectively performs robust estimation. Now, the little trick that I didn't mention here, that would be 
something, I mean, that, that a good stats class will cover. You don't necessarily pick the thresholds of one and minus one for where you cross over as a hard constraint. You adapt them dynamically to the estimation problem that you're just trimming away the smallest and the largest terms. And that effectively performs outlier removal. Except that when you're doing regression, it doesn't exactly remove the outlier. You're just bounding the influence and, and with that the gradient that any single observation can have. So this way, it's not that you're ignoring points that are at their extremes. You're just making sure that they, don't, they cannot push things too hard. Now, <clears throat> this is actually a very common technique that's being used in deep learning training. It's called gradient clipping. Now, gradient clipping sounds infinitely cooler than Huber's robust loss, but that's really what it does, right? Um, so I covered it here such that later on when we do things like gradient clipping, you understand what's really going on. There are some reasons why you'll need to do that, because if your gradients are too large, then the optimization can diverge, but it also simply means that you shouldn't be giving individual observations too much weight. So this renders a lot of optimization procedures a lot more stable. And there, that, here's the statistical reason for it. Any other questions? Yes? Sorry, I'm actually kind of confused. Uh, so what are we trying to do here? We're, we're developing different loss functions so, for? So we just looked at different loss functions. And <coughs> that's because, well, besides the least mean squares loss, you might end up adding lots of different other loss functions to your optimization problem to perform different types of estimation. And what we're doing here is we're just covering the really, really simple losses first, namely for regression, because here I can draw nice pictures. Once you go to you know, structured multi-class losses and so on, it's a lot harder to visualize what's going on. The other reason is I wanted to cover the connection between gradient clipping and what you do otherwise, namely that you do constrain the upper bound on, of you know, the magnitude of the loss. So if you have then a large vectorial loss, you basically just make sure that the two norm of that vector doesn't exceed a certain number. And since this is an undergrad class, we're doing things the slightly quick and dirty way by giving you more intuition than necessarily all the math. Um, so there's this tension between how much we can cover and how deep we go. And that's where we give you the intuition, but we can't really dive into all the details to quite the extent that a graduate level class would do. Okay, so this is pretty much all that we have for regression losses. <coughs>